Next, in keeping with moving this whole show along, um, I'd like to bring to the stage Sean Peterson. He's our Senior Vice President of Legal and Government Affairs for the NIADA. He is uh, at the tip of the spear on helping set NIADA's legislative policy with our executive committee, our legislative committee, our buy here, pay here commissions, um, and all the, the various committees that help weigh in on uh, what that direction actually is. So uh, without further ado, let's bring up Sean Peterson, our Senior Vice President of Legal and Government Affairs. Sean? Break a leg, buddy. Good morning. You know me, I'm a wanderer. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I want to thank my good friends, Andy Koblenz and Neil Bradley, for being a part of our show today. Wasn't that fantastic? They had great information. Um, we have a lot of great things that are happening at NIADA as it relates to our government affairs program. I wish I could spend four hours. Do you want to do four hours? Can we do four hours to get into lunch? No. <laughs> I wish I could spend four hours with you just sharing with you every nook and cranny of things that we're working on. But unfortunately, we have about 25 minutes. So we're going to have to hit some of the highlights. But I will be around all through the week. I hope you feel free uh, to grab me, ask me questions. We'll talk through some of the things that we're working on in greater detail if you have questions about that. But let me yeah, just give you a little snapshot of what, uh, what we've got going on. One of the things that's important to us... Um, in our government affairs department is creating a vision. What is it that we're trying to do on your behalf? Well, of course, we're there to represent your interests in Washington, D.C. That is our first and foremost uh, opportunity. I love waking up every morning and doing that on your behalf. We also want to help our state associations make sure that your interests in state capitals are represented. There's a lot of things, and Neil mentioned this just a moment ago, there's a lot of things that originate in state capitals that have the tendency to spread like wildfire across the country. And some of those things, those concepts, actually make their way into Congress as well. So we are uh, constantly working with our state associations. You've seen that we want to make sure we can foster other relationships with key trade associations. Hence the relationship that we have with NADA and NAAA and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others. We want to find and support candidates for federal office that will back and support you and your industry. We needed to create a way that we could do that, and hence that's where the NIDA PAC comes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the in the minute. We also want to make sure that you have the opportunity to make your voice heard. I'll be the first to tell you that I'm a hack. Michael Frazier is up here shaking his head. Yes, you are, Sean. I'm a hack. I get paid to go and represent your interests. People in Congress know that I'm a hack. People in Congress and regulatory agencies know that this is my job. They respect that. There's value that comes in that. But your voice carries much more weight than mine. I've got great stories. I wish I could get into them. But come and grab me, and I'll tell you a great story about Billy Threadgill and I and Congressman Rice. The last part of our vision is we want to look for opportunities where we can uh, shore up our defense, make sure that we have uh, the protections in place to defend the industry, but we want to look for opportunities where we can throw the ball down the field as well. What are some of the initiatives that we can go on the offensive on to see if we can make change for the betterment? There's been a lot of change in Washington, D.C. over the course of the last uh, eight, ten months since the November elections. Uh, you know that the House of Representatives has flipped from Republican control to Democrat control. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. Maxine Waters is now the chair of one of the most influential committees that we deal with, the House Financial Services Committee. Frank Pallone is the chair of the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Janice Sikowski, that's an important name. She is a, a subcommittee chair of the Consumer Protection Committee on that House and Energy Committee. That is where some important legislation that will affect us uh, comes into play. One of the most important things that we uh, feel like we've done is make sure that once these folks took control, we had an opportunity to engage them, uh, let them know who we are, what the issues uh, are that we're working on. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that a little bit later. Uh, in the Senate, the Republicans actually increased their majority. What does that mean? Well, the leadership in the Senate has mostly stayed the same. Mitch McConnell continues to be the majority leader. John Thune has slid into the number two position in 
um, in the Senate. He's been a great ally of ours, having chaired one of the most important committees of ours uh, in past Congresses. So we're, we're grateful that we have those kind of allies to work with. In the regulatory side, we've seen a complete overhaul of the Federal Trade Commission. Five brand new commissioners appointed by President Trump have taken office in the last year. Three Republicans, two Democrats. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the FTC activity as well. We've also seen a brand new director at the CFPB, Kathleen Craniger. Uh, she used to work for Mick Mulvaney, who's now the president's chief of staff and continues to do work uh, on the uh, Office of, of Management and Budget as well. But we're uh, excited for the opportunity to meet and, and uh, engage uh, Director Craniger, and we'll talk about some of the things that they're working on. We're still waiting on Senate confirmation of a NHTSA director. That's important because there's a lot of things that are important initiatives at NHTSA that, quite frankly, we don't think are getting done in part because we don't have a full-time confirmed director there. So knowing that all these changes are, um, have happened in Washington over the course of the last 10 months or so, we meet with a, a legislative committee every month. We have a conference call. Once these changes were announced and as uh, the new Congress was sworn in the first of the year, one of the most important things that we felt we needed to do was organize our legislative committee and have a discussion with them. What are the priorities? What do we need to focus on? We broke those into three buckets, a congressional bucket. There's always things happening in Congress that are important to us. But what are some of those things? Well, we've talked, at years of, we've talked for years about recalls. We'll continue to talk about recalls because that's an important issue. We'd like to see the CFPB change. We'd like to see some reform there, make it more in line with other agencies. We'll talk about that in a minute. One of the things that we've started to see is an increased activity in, in um, regulation and potential legislation, enforcement actions that would impact what happens in the FNI office. That's a priority for ours. We'll talk a little bit more in further. We also have a, a list of priorities in the regulatory world, working with federal agencies. These are some of those things that we've kind of highlighted as, as efforts to work on over the course of the next year. Some of these change in level of priority based upon what's happening, uh, but there's some things that are um, offensive in nature on this list as well that we'll talk about in a moment. And then we have this little bucket of potpourri kind of things. I mean, Alex... Alex Trebek's done Jeopardy now for, what, 40 years, and now he's got the cancer. So we, we wanted to at least give a shout-out. So the potpourri bucket is a, a shout-out to Alex Trebek. Um, one of the things we have initiated in our legislative committee is a curbstoning task force that we can help uh, our state associations work on and develop some really strong, solid curbstoning uh, legislation and policies, hopefully uh, look for opportunities to engage the federal government on that issue as well. So let's talk a little bit about some of these issues in the remaining uh, moments that we have. For years, uh, if you've come to this conference, you know that recalls has been one of the top priorities, that there has been a, a movement afoot from some in Congress, consumer advocates and such, to ban you from selling any vehicle with any open recall. Let me say that again. Any vehicle with any open recall, any sale. Retail sale, wholesale sale, you name it. Wouldn't be able to do it. We have worked for years to make sure that that doesn't happen. We've been battling bills that have been introduced by Congresswoman Schakowsky. Remember I said she's now chairing the subcommittee. She chairs the subcommittee that this bill would come up through if it was a standalone bill. So she's an important member of Congress. We've been battling that same legislation introduced by Senator Blumenthal out of Connecticut and Senator Markey out of Massachusetts. Where does it stand? Well... We got word earlier in the year that this is something that they want to take up again. That they're not moving away from it. Hopefully, we've got them in a position where it's not something that will happen immediately. But rest assured that it's something that we're going to continue to have to do battle on. We have seen over the course of the last five or six months uh, a, a re-energized consumer movement to push for this kind of legislation. We've seen articles. You may have seen these articles in the USA Today. Very uh, derogatory to our position. Uh, you may have seen uh, an article in Consumer Reports that was published uh, I don't know, a month or a month and a half ago. 
very derogatory towards our position again. So there's this groundswell of, of movement from consumer advocates to continue to push for this. This is an issue that we're going to continue to play defense on. We work very closely with our allies. I mentioned these trade associations that we partnered up with. Andy and I, Andy Koblenz and I talk about this issue all the time with their, um, their legal team and their regulatory team and their legislative team. We're lockstep on this issue and will continue to be. We've actually started to see some state legislation on this issue as well. We've seen bills that have come up and passed in the Pennsylvania legislature and the Tennessee legislature that prohibit uh, the sale of any vehicle with any open recall unless you're disclosing the existence of that uh, recall to the consumer. Is that something that could come up in Congress? Who knows? But the point being, we have something now on the books at state levels that could be begged, borrowed, and stolen in the federal level. We've seen the state attorneys general take enforcement actions against dealers as it relates to recalls. We've seen the same thing from the Federal Trade Commission over the course of the last several years. I'm happy to announce this is something that we, um, we started to partner with uh, the, the National Safety Council last October, or September, excuse me, uh, on a public awareness campaign called Check to Protect. Uh, our friends at NAD, our friends at NAAA are part of this as well. One of the things that we're doing in this, in this campaign is looking for alternative solutions to ensure that recall, uh, recall repairs happen, but to do them in a way that will uh, ease the burden on consumers, uh, ease the burden on dealers, and I would put us in the same bucket as consumers, right? You all know that we can't do anything with those recall repairs. You don't have the ability to fix them. You can't fix them. Federal law does not let you fix them. So you're beholden to... Um, manufacturers for the parts availabilities, making those available to their franchise dealers and, uh, and such. So we're looking for ways to ease the burden on you to get those vehicles fixed. We've talked to, to a lot of manufacturers through this Check to Protect campaign to open the door for mobile units to go to your dealership and fix the vehicles while at the dealership or through the auctions. Uh, we've got some really exciting things that we're working on. We'll hopefully have some more announcements down the road. But that recall issue is real. I don't want you to think that it's not going away because it is not. Uh, my images didn't happen, uh, didn't work out on that slide very well. Uh, the CFPB was the CFPB, then it was the BCFP, and now we're back to the CFPB again. So that just gives you a sense, and Neil alluded to this idea of, you know, Democrats doing things one way, Republicans doing things a different way, and then vice versa. It just We're doing things different because it's different. The, the CFPB's name is a part of that. We're back to CFPB again. And I mentioned to you that we would like to see that change. Well, what does that mean? The CFPB is one of the few agencies in Washington, D.C. that is controlled by one person, that is not subject to termination by the president except for cause. That's an awfully powerful person in D.C. if it wants to be. And I think we saw that with the past administrations. We would like to see that change to a bipartisan commission structure just like I mentioned with the FTC. Five brand new commission commissioners. Three on one political party, two on the other. We'd also like to see the uh, CFPB's budget subject to congressional appropriations. They don't get their funding through any source other than just getting a portion of the Fed's budget. They don't have to go to Congress and say, we need X number of dollars to make our program work. How many of you are parents? You all have teenage kids? I got teenage kids. The things that used to uh, work for me when I'd get in trouble with my parents don't work with my kids, right? The only power that I have over my kids is they come and say, Dad, can I have a little money to do something, something? Sorry, you do not. No go. That's how Congress, through the appropriations process, can rein in agencies. You want money? Sorry, not going to happen. We would like to see that happen with the CFPB. Over the course of uh, the last six or eight months since Director Craninger has come into place, one of the things that actually started with Mulvaney but has been carried on with, uh, with Craninger is looking at a complete review of the Bureau's processes. What does the Bureau do? What should it do? What should it focus on? They submitted or released, I guess I should say, 
a request for information on all of their processes, from how they do investigations, how they send subpoenas, what their enforcement action process looked like, how about consumer complaints, how about engaging in um, public uh, affairs and public relations with the regulated entities, with public at large. We submitted comments to the Bureau on the vast majority of those process, asking them to be much more transparent in what they do. Be more open, be more fair, be more timely. The Bureau has has been very active over the course of the last couple of years, um, but here recently in the last year or so, they've released some reports on their activity uh, as they go into to big banks where they have this supervisory authority, they can show up and just dive into their books on a regular basis. Uh, they're a- examining auto finance very hard, particularly in how accounts get serviced. What are your collections like? What are your repos like? Et cetera, et cetera. Although those don't necessarily have any um, precedential value in the sense of you must do X, Y, and Z, it gives you a snapshot as to what the Bureau thinks and what's important to them. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at some of that information, particularly those of you that do buy here, pay here. Just a couple of the issues that they've looked at in those reports there. The Bureau here in the last uh, six, eight weeks or so has released a proposed rule on debt collection. We're in the process of working with our buy here, pay here commission to review that rule in great detail to make sure that one, it doesn't apply to buy here, pay here dealers servicing their own accounts. We're pretty confident that that's the case. The proposed rule focuses on third party collectors and what they do as they engage collecting somebody else's debt. What we're concerned about, and we'll likely file comments on this, We're concerned about the precedential value that this may have if the Bureau decides it wants to do a rule focused on first-party creditors. Some of the things that we see in this rule that are very problematic are are limitations on the number of times that you can, or the collectors can contact a consumer over the course of a week, for example, um, and the methods that they can use. If some of that happens to come over into a rule that's focused on first-party creditors servicing their accounts, that could be problematic. So we're going to really get into a deep dive and file some comments on that. One of the other things that the Bureau has, has recently announced is they're going to engage in what they call a symposium series, public uh, awareness campaigns and, and working with regulated entities uh, to, to talk about important issues that may need rule, may need clarification, may need some additional guidance. One of those being, what is abusive? The Bureau has the authority to prosecute abusive conduct, take enforcement action on abusive conduct. But that's not really defined anywhere. So the Bureau has said, we're going to hold this uh, series, this symposium, and talk to the regulated entities and try to come up with a definition of what is abusive conduct. We need some transparency, on, and that, I think, is a positive step. One thing I'll tell you about the Bureau is enforcement is real. All right? We, we heard Ken talk about, we heard Neil talk about some of the, the deregulatory efforts of the Trump administration. Yes, that is happening. Yes, that is a good thing. Yes, that is a positive thing. But that doesn't mean that these agencies aren't going to pursue bad actors if they feel like there's some kind of conduct that needs to, to be corrected. And we have seen the CFPB take action in our space. Uh, we've seen them go after companies like Santander and Wells Fargo for, for auto financing related issues. We've seen them pursue uh, uh, companies for violations of the Civil Service Relief Act and other sorts of things. So lest you think that the CFPB is just there and they're marking time and not doing anything, couldn't be further from the truth. Now, what does this mean inside the F&I office? I want to kind of get you to start thinking about a nomenclature change. We have this coalition of uh, interested parties that are working on issues as it pertains to the sale of F&I products, gap waiver products, uh, credit life products, extended service contracts, et cetera. We want to make sure that we have a good, solid group that can tackle these issues as they come up. But what we've found as we've organized this group is the consumer advocates, the plaintiff's bar, and others have really hijacked 
how we refer to these types of products. They use sorts, these sorts of, and by the way, regulators are starting to do this as well. They use phrases like add-on products. I mean, that kind of sounds dirty, doesn't it? Even when we use terms like ancillary products, well, that's not really an important part of the deal if it's ancillary, right? You know, I know that products like GAP, products like extended service contracts, have some significant value to the consumer. They protect the consumer. How many of you have a life insurance policy that you're paying on? How many of you have had to draw on that life insurance policy? Hopefully nobody's hand goes up, right? <laughs> You're making an investment in that policy for a reason, right? You hopefully never have to draw. You don't want to draw on it, but it's there in case you need it. Well, you and I know that that's true of some of these products that's, that we sell in the F&I office. So one of the first things that we've done is we need to change the narrative of how we refer to these products. So rather than refer to them as add-on products or ancillary products, we as a group came up and decided we need to change the narrative. Let's start referring to them as voluntary protection products. Consumers have the choice. They are not compelled to buy these products, and they protect them. There's value for them. Several years ago, the CFPB uh, put together this working group to kind of look at what those products look like. And this is a uh, little phrase out of their uh, a memo that was written to then CFPP Director Cordray. Look at what they say there. We're going to study, investigate, make recommendations, concern, including subjective markups of interest rates, financing of high margin additional products, right? There's that phrase. And buy here, pay here dealers. I mean, that sentence, pretty scary. I think that covers probably most of us in this room. This is what their quote-unquote educational material says about these kind of products. Consumers experience decision fatigue and had negative perceptions of the process and products. This is the kind of atmosphere and environment that we're, we're battling right now. NCLC is the National Consumer Law Center. And they released a study, I use that term loosely because I'm not sure that there was much academic about this quote-unquote study, but they're calling for all kinds of changes as it relates to dealers and the sale of these kind of products. That's led to some significant action. Um, You've heard me talk about, if you were here last year, you heard us talk about the Military Lending Act and the rule interpretation the Department of Defense had that, in essence, prevents, makes it practically impossible to, uh, to sell these kind of products, credit products, like gap waiver to military service members. We continue to work on that issue to get the um, administration to remove that interpretation. We hear positive things that they want to do it. We just don't know when. We're continuing to push for a win. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through some of these sorts of uh, things. Uh, but we started to see a lot of activity in buy here, pay here uh, dealerships and, and the use of these kind of products. We've seen state AGs get involved in enforcement action on those sorts of things. What are some of the other issues we're, we're interested in working on? 1099C, we'd like to see some changes with uh, 1099C requirements. The FTC has a uh, proposal to amend the safeguards rule. This is going to have a significant impact on us. We're in the process of reviewing that right now. We'll have some comments to be, to be filed in August, but what the CFPB, or excuse me, the FTC is proposing is, is a, a pretty radical overhaul um, that may change your the flexibility uh, that you have in complying with the safeguards rule. Interestingly enough, just last week, and Andy and I were talking about this backstage. Just last week, the FTC announced a settlement with Dealer Built, a DMS provider, for uh, a, a privacy breach and data breach that they had, where customer information went out the door. We're concerned that what is happening in that case may have an impact on what the FTC now thinks about the safeguard rules changes, but it's, it's something that we're uh, examining pretty quick. We've been engaged with the Department of Commerce on the tariff issues that Neil talked about. We filed comments with the Department of Labor on their proposed changes to the white collar overtime exemption rule. We're working with the Department of Justice on their NIMVITAS database. Uh, there's some uh, ongoing litigation that's uh, happening in the state of Ohio uh, that we'll talk to you about uh, during the course of the week if you want to come and um, pick our brains about. 
We've seen uh, GPS legislation that has cropped up uh, in several state legislatures that we've been active in pushing back on, and we'll continue to push back on that. Uh, we've worked with the uh, AMVA is the trade organization that represents the um, state BMV directors and such. We've been working with them on some policy documents as it pertains to Internet sales and how to handle salvage titles. I mentioned our curb stoning task force. We have uh, some recommendations that we just approved yesterday in our legislative committee meeting where we'll work with the state attorney's general office and try to get them involved and active in pursuing curb stoners under theories of unfair and deceptive acts and practices against consumers. In the last few minutes, I just want to talk about the importance of what we do in the policy world and how you can get involved. Uh, the NIDA PAC I mentioned uh, we have in place to help us find and, and support those candidates for office that are going to take positions that are important to you. It's how we get involved. It's how we can help and engage them. Uh, we see we raised almost $220,000 um, in 2018 for the 2018 elections. We supported 37 candidates. This is just a few of them. We support candidates from both sides of the aisle. We are not a partisan entity. We've already made some donations in 2019, just as an example of a couple right there that you can see. How can you get involved? How can you make your voice heard? I mentioned we had uh, an opportunity to meet with Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, Congressman Henry Cuellar. We had some, uh, some Texas representation there on that. We've had dealers in Florida that have hosted their congressmen. We've had dealers in, uh, hey, Michael Darrell with Mitch McConnell right there. Um, dealers in Pennsylvania that have hosted their congressmen. Illinois, go, it goes on and on and on. We've had a round table with, um, with uh, Congressman Patrick McHenry, who's the ranking Republican on the House Financial Services Committee. I would encourage you to look for opportunities to engage your member of Congress. Have them come to your dealership. Tell them what you do. Show them what you do. We can help you set that up. If you have any interest in that whatsoever, please let me know. Call me. We'll help you get that organized. Talk to some of the people that you see in these pictures. They'll tell you how important it is and how cool it was to have their member of Congress come and, and, and see the dealership and what it is that they do. Last thing that you can do to make your voice heard is plan to be in Washington, D.C. in September. We have our national policy conference. Just to give you a little snapshot of last year's conference in 2018, it was the most successful conference we've ever had. We had more than 200 attendees. We have had 15 lobby groups on Capitol Hill that met with more than 120 congressional offices, including plenty of members of Congress. We had regulatory updates from these key agencies that have touch points uh, and oversight over you. We award a legislative uh, legislator of the year, somebody that we know is out there fighting the good fight for us. Just so you know, Congressman Mike Kelly out of Pennsylvania, who happens to be a car dealer as well, got that award last year. So when is it? September 23rd through the 25th at the Ritz-Carlton in Pentagon City. If you go to NIAD Policy Conference, which I'm pretty sure that the website is now active, you can get some information, you can uh, register, you can book your hotel. We want everybody there. We need you there. Like I said, going back to the very beginning, I'm a hack. You're not. They want to hear from you. You'll make much more of a difference than I ever can or ever will. We'll help you make that difference. Make your voice heard. Like I said, I'll be around all week. I hope you feel free to grab me, and let's talk through some of these issues in greater detail. Thanks for being here. I hope you all have a great conference.